Hey, this is Jared Cochran with Family Church. Welcome to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe so we can get you these messages every single week. Have a great day. I don't know about smart, because to be honest with you, I had to ask Kelsey what the dean's list was. Because I have not been in school for some time. And here you are, talking about wanting things quick and running, and uh, that's what we're preaching on today. We're going to be talking about endurance. You didn't know anything, because you've been asking me all, he's been asking me all week what I'm preaching on, and I'm not telling. (laughs) You guys excited? I'm excited. Brandon, I'm a little hot. I'm ringing. I'm out of breath. I'm trying to catch my breath. I'm talking about endurance today, and I've got zero endurance. I'm still getting over a, uh, whatever this flu or cold or sickness thing is that's going around. So if I cough (coughs) like that, I'm sorry. It's an illustration. Well, the microphone's right here for covering my mouth. It's going to get louder. Uh, If we can stand for the uh, reading of the Word of God today, I'm in Hebrews chapter 12. Today I'm preaching out of the NIV. If you don't like it, I'm sorry, but uh, it's still the Word of God. It's just a little bit easier to read. Starting in verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded... By such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So today, like I said, we're going to be talking about endurance. And, you know, running is one thing, but if you're going to run some distance, it takes a little bit of discipline, right? Amen. Y'all are quiet today. You're going to have to warm up because I'm excited. I just gave it all back there. Now I got to give it all up here. I'm just playing. Let's bow our heads. Father, thank you so much for this word that you have given me. First and foremost, before I am able to give it to them, Lord, I pray that your word does not, re- does not return void, that it goes out to whoever needs to hear it, and it touches the lives that needs to touch, because we all need endurance in this race, God. In your name, amen. As you find your seat, tell your neighbor, I'm going the distance. No, I'm fine. We are going the distance. So I want to open up, tell you about this guy named Dean Carnizes, and I have no idea if I said that right. But Dean started running when he was in kindergarten, as kindergartners do. But he actually, and I think he was in California, but he ran to and from school. Now, I don't know about y'all. I can't trust my kids to run down the driveway, and I'm not going to trust them to run to and from school, except for Riley, because she's homeschooled. So as long as she comes out of her room, she's good. Uh, as he became bored, though, as we typically do, and especially little boys, he became bored with his route. He tried to find a little bit more fun routes. He tried to find longer routes to run. He tried to find a little bit more scenic route instead of looking at the same thing. He liked a little change of pace. So he started running in school events shortly after that. And then he helped, <laughs> this is ridiculous, he helped organize them starting in third grade. Does anybody have any third graders in here besides me? One. Well, you, what? That's cheating. I am the only one in here with third graders. I'm just kidding. Um, well, then when he gets in junior high, he gets his first mentor named Jack. And Jack taught track. And I've been waiting all week to say that rhyme. Because of his track coach and his own determination, and this is junior high, he won the one-mile California state long-distance relationship. But he didn't always enjoy running. He actually stopped running for about 15 years because he didn't get along with the track coach at his high school. That guy's name was Benner Cummings, and if my name was Benner, I'd probably be bitter too. (laughs) So even though he actually ran better and farther and more often than his classmates, I guess for whatever reason, he didn't get along with his track coach, and they had a little falling out, and he stopped running. And this is going to make sense in a minute. Now you're like, where's the Bible? 
But I want you to grab that first, though. If he had stopped running because of an outside source, he would have, we wouldn't be talking about him right now. And yes, we're going to talk about Jesus for you people that are like super, whoa. But uh, if he had lost his determination just because of one person, his story would not have mattered at all. And so I want, what I want you guys to take away with this is don't let people throw you off your path. And don't let them throw you off of your purpose. Your success cannot, it should not be determined by someone else other than Jesus. So why are we talking about Dean? Dean holds the world record for the longest distance of nonstop, no breaks running. Does anyone want to take a guess how long it is? Four years. What is this, Forrest Gump? He was running. No. This is ridiculous. Dean completed. I mean, you got a lot of faith in people. We need to be more like Tanya. Holy cow. Four years. I'm not running four minutes. Dean completed the longest nonstop run by human, I love how they put this, by a human being in 2005. Since AI has taken over the world, they're just going to run every race and win. Y'all thought men taking over the women's stuff was bad. Wait till the robots do it. This dude, this is nonstop, no breaks. Dean ran 350 miles or 560 kilometers for our uh, international audience nonstop. It took him 80 hours and 44 minutes. That is more than twice as long as our normal work week where y'all complain the entire time and this dude just ran. <laughs> this has got to be where the, well, I guess this was after Forrest Gump because it's 2005. He also ran a marathon to the South Pole which was negative 13 degrees Fahrenheit without snowshoes because some people are just insane. He ran a marathon in each of the 50 states in 50 consecutive days. For you Palaka people, that means like in a row, consecutive, like day after day after day. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. He won, has anybody heard what the, the Badwater Ultra Marathon? Somebody does. Awesome. Thank you. He won the Badwater Ultra Marathon, which was a distance of 135 miles across Death Valley, which was in 120 degree Fahrenheit in 2004. So he did that before. That's probably why he could breathe so much because his lungs melted while he was in the bad marathon. <laughs> that was the year before. Now, obviously, to run this kind of distance, it takes discipline. It takes determination. It takes preparation, right? It takes some training. Where's all my gym people at? Brandon, don't raise your hand. You're cheating. <laughs> But write this down. You don't win crowns by quitting. You don't win crowns by quitting. And if you don't want to write that one down, which you should have at least a Bible or a notepad, or everybody's got a phone, so I will allow you this time in church to actually look at your phone. And if you're going to scroll Facebook, we'll just swipe over to the notes app really quick when somebody looks beside you and play it off. But write this down or say, actually, you know what? Say it out loud because we're going to speak it in faith. The effectiveness of my faith is endangered by the level of my endurance. The effectiveness of my faith is endangered by the level of my endurance. That is why we have to stay disciplined. If you could put verse 1 back up for me real quick, quick, please. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, there we go. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses that we're surrounded. We are being watched by the pioneers of the faith, those who have gone before us, like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, all the greats, obviously Jesus. Uh, and we're also watched by the persecutors of faith. Everybody around you is always watching what you're doing. And sometimes the, uh, I want to make sure I say this right, sometimes your character communicates a whole lot more than your vocal cords do. See, they are watching because they know that we come to church, even if you're not posting about it on Facebook that much, and they're watching to see how you act. Before they ever want to hear anything that you say, they're going to see how you're acting. They want to see your character. Do you act like Jesus? Do you emulate Jesus? Before they ever want to hear you say anything about Jesus, your character is going to communicate a whole lot more than your mouth does. So you need to put some discipline into your dialogue. I know with... Uh, with this traffic, as crazy as it's getting, uh, it's really easy to, you know, let some four-letter single-syllable words fly out. And I'm not bashing anybody because this is family church. 
and we're real. Oh, that was quiet. No, we don't cuss. Nobody says anything. Yeah, well, wait till uh, what football game is on later today when you're shouting at, shouting at the screen. Or, uh, you know, I don't watch football, so I don't know, but I've got somebody on Facebook that's just like the bandwagon jumper, so when y'all get done with the Jaguars because they lost, and now you're jumping on the other team. Sorry. But it's, it's a whole lot easier, right? It's a lot easier to cuss out your ex than it is to pray for them. It's a whole lot easier to get mad at your boss and pray for your boss and show up early and keep pressing on even though he's persecuting you. No, he actually just wants you to show up on time instead of hitting snooze every 15 minutes for half an hour. I guess that's only twice. That sounded a lot better. But we need to get some discipline in our dialogue because our character is going to communicate a whole lot more than our vocal cords do. And with that... Just moving on, you know, we need, to, we need to throw everything off that hinders us, right? In Ephesians 4.22, it says, you were taught, taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. We are called to lay that off, to, to, to cast it off, to take it off, to literally shed it. We need to stop trying to be like our old selves. And with that, we need to quit bashing ourselves because of who we used to be. And accept that we have a story that God is using to further his purpose. Your past is not your purpose. He can use it for your purpose. What the enemy meant for evil, God will use for good. And it's too easy to get stuck in the old way of thinking, in the old way of life, and never move forward or be too afraid to take a step of faith and move forward because you're, you're persecuting yourself by your past. So we need to lay it off. We need to strip ourselves of our old ways. And yes, Jesus changes your heart. But, you know, it's, it's because of free will that you have to have that, that daily discipline to, to take those steps and, and to lay it down. Because there is a, there's a shifting when you shed things off. And Jesus gives you that heart change in order to move forward and to lay things down. But it is up to you to actively take those steps to lay it off. Like if I'm getting, I'm sweating right now, but I'm not taking the jacket off because I think it looked cool. But Jesus isn't going to take it off of me. I've got to take it off. And I'm not talking about stripping in church, but you should be kind of stripping in church when you want to lay all your sin at the altar and accept that Jesus has already forgiven you of the things that you're still beating yourself up for. But when you make those decisions to stop responding to their text, and you make those decisions to not go out every single night this week and get blackout drunk and then show up at church smelling like alcohol, which, thank God you are here, I am glad. If somebody is on your row and they smell like they just left a Bob Marley concert, and I've got to get an updated illustration for that, for the young, you know, I guess they do know Bob Marley, but they are in the right place, and you can keep looking at them and judging them all you want. They are the exact kind of person that Jesus would have wanted in church. He did not come for the righteous. He came for the sick. I told y'all I'm feeling good today, but we have to make that daily discipline to actively deny our flesh, right? You can't, you can't just keep calling your old dealer every time you feel that withdrawal. You've got to take the steps. And, and if all you're doing is just deleting their number in your phone, that's not really going to cut it. You should block them. Change your phone number. Whatever you need to do to break yourself off of those old chains, do it. And I know that sounds sometimes a little bit easier. I've never had a drug addiction, but I have seen it, and I know it's hard to break through. But with God, all things are possible. And you've just got to take that. You've got to strip that off of you. You know, it takes discipline to not keep returning to that same website. And we won't say which one it is because there's any number of them that you can access at any time on your phone. But you have to be disciplined enough to not, to not keep returning to that stuff. You have to lay that down. And, the, you know, all it does is leave you feeling guilty and empty and shameful as soon as you've finished looking at it. So what is the point? Do you want to move forward or do you want to stay stuck? But when you start shifting things off, there is a shift that happens in you. Your flesh decreases and your faith will increase. You'll begin to think, okay, God, I can do this. With you, all things are possible. That's just not like, oh, I like sports. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, you need to be walking with Christ daily and being disciplined enough. And then you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. But it takes that, right? There's that, there's that shift in you. And sin, it's, it, the Bible says it. It so easily entangles us. It so easily 
trips you up. It's designed to get you to look at your failures, to focus on your failures. It's designed to leave you comfortable in your chaotic mess to where you get to the point that it doesn't convict you anymore, right? Like if you are stuck in something and you've been doing it for so long and now you're at the place that it doesn't convict you anymore, you're in a really, really deep, dark, bad place. But God can also allow you, and I'm not saying he brings this on you, but you look at Job and he allows things to happen to people in order that he can use it to further his purpose. Like Job, it says he was a righteous man, but God allowed Satan to test him and to cast him down so that Job's self-righteousness was revealed. Because when you truly read the story, you know, his buddies, uh, they had some good points to say, but they were also had a really twisted way of thinking. And they didn't get it all right. There are some little nuggets of who God is, but there's also their way of thinking of that. If, as, as long as you're good, God will bless you. But if you're bad, God will curse you. And that's not true. I mean, you know, you look at the world. There's, there's the wicked who prosper, and then there's the righteous who suffer as well. What happens happens to people. But God used Job's torment in order to get his self-righteousness to the surface so he could, so he could focus on God more. I love that line, you know, my redeemer lives. And so, you know, we just need to, we really need to throw off the things that are hindering us. Because you can't run this race that we're called to run if you're allowing all the things from your past to continue weighing you down. You don't look at anybody in the Olympics or wherever else they run or track and field, and they're not running their marathon. They're not running their race and their competition with weights on their ankles. But we keep trying to do it. Instead of laying it all at God's feet, how I, how I preached the other week about the woman with the issue of blood who still suffered mentally until she laid everything at God's feet, we keep trying to hold on to everything in order to hide it from people because we're too embarrassed about what it may make us look like instead of realizing everyone in this room is broken in some way. It's just, I mean, we can make a list and go down the list and eventually we're gonna hit something that everybody's dealing with in here. God will read your mail. I know you don't want him to. Nobody wants him to, right? We don't want people to find out what we're dealing with. But that's the whole point of laying it down at his feet and, and just accepting and being humble that everyone in this world is just as broken as you are. The only difference is when you believe and you put your faith in Jesus, you've accepted that you're broken. You've, you've, you've chosen to admit it instead of trying to go the way of the world and keep on sinning and keep on staying in your sin and leaving the weights that are on you. When I mean, you can't run as far, you're not going to have the endurance to keep running because of what's weighing you down. And I love this, to run with perseverance, the race that is marked out with us. The, the word in, in uh, the ESV, which is more of a word-for-word -word translation, it says endurance instead of perseverance. They're interchangeable. And this is Paul, again, invoking, and I'm going to butcher this name. It is to me, and I don't know how you say it. It's spelled so weird. It's these games that took place in Corinth uh, every couple years, and they, are, they were only second to the Olympics to give you an idea of what they were. So they were, they were important, right? There's a lot of people. There's a lot of people training for it. And Paul has used it. Uh, I almost used, used his illustration in... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I think it's 24 to 27, until God led me to, to just go off of Hebrews. Um, but he uses this illustration because it relates to so many people. And then he's talking about these games because this event was so big that it drew just these massive crowds. And I know there's always those people who think church is supposed to be only filled with like 20-something people, and we're just gonna have like this tiny little gathering because that's the only way to worship Jesus when there's like five people in the building. Have y'all missed how many people were there when he gave the Sermon on the Mount? And when it says that there was the feeding of the 4,000, guess what? It was 4,000 men. That doesn't count the women and children. When it says the 5,000, it was the 5,000 men. It doesn't count the women and children. The generous estimates, I believe, are somewhere around 20,000 people. Can you imagine finding a parking spot today if we had a building that could fit 20,000 people? Some of y'all would just stay home and say you would watch it online, but instead you're just going to turn on diners, drive-ins, and dives and go eat some donuts. I am all for online church. Thank you if you're tuning in, but it is really easy to get distracted, is it not? 
And that's where some more discipline comes in. Because if you're not disciplined enough, you're not going to sit down and watch it. You're not going to engage. But God wants you engaged. So Paul uses this because it's a big event that draws these massive crowds so that he can use it as a giant platform to preach the gospel. Right? So Paul is, he's a, he's a tent maker at this time. So he is literally financing his ministry by building and providing tents for these people. And he's also ingrained himself in the crowds with the athletes, with the people that are attending the games in order to, because he knows that if he preaches to them and if he can get Jesus to reach them and touch them, they will go back to their homeland and they will also further the gospel because they'll begin to preach about it. I love how like the, 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 the show, The Chosen, lays it out where it's just, once Jesus starts moving and doing his works, it just like spreads like wildfire. This is why church grows, because it should burn so deeply inside of you that you can't help but talk about it and share it with your friends. So obviously, with this being an important game, the athletes are training really hard for this. This is why Paul uses the phrase about running the race. In 1 Corinthians, he uses the illustration of, <clears throat> of boxing. And he literally talks about beating his body into submission. I mean, that is the, all you need to know about disciplining yourself in order to move forward, to strip yourself of anything that is holding you back and running the race, to literally beat your body into submission because your flesh is so strong, but God is wanting your faith to be stronger. Amen. And so what really I love about this is unlike the modern Olympics where there's gold, silver, and bronze, and we just give medals to everybody as long as they participate. Uh, in the old ancient games, only the winner received the crown. Only one. And we should get back to that. Because if you ain't first, you're last. <laughs> and there was, there was, this is just like this life. There, there was no second place award. You don't get to go in heaven just because you participated in church. I know little Jimmy got up on the t-ball field and missed the ball like nine times, even though it's on the stand, and he got the participation award, but that doesn't apply to your Christianity walk with Jesus. It doesn't apply to your relationship with Jesus. You actually have to do something with it. I'm getting ahead of myself. I see if there's kids in here for this next part. So they had to take an oath. I'm going to say it. So if you have children in here... It's not a bad word. I know y'all are like, be careful what you say. Anyways, they took an oath. They had to use a strict diet for 10 months. And right there, half of the room was like, nope, I'm out. Diet, uh uh Who likes Krispy Kreme donuts? I love them. When are we going to build one in town? And if that didn't get you, the rest of the crowd, they also didn't drink wine for 10 months. Oh, oh we can't talk about that. No Pino, I'm not running. And if that didn't get you, this is where I'm falling off. No meat for 10 months. I don't know about y'all. I like a good hamburger. Thank you. This is the South. We got barbecue. We got brisket. After church, you can go beat the Baptists and get a good brisket. Not beat them, but like beat them to the restaurant. I want to clarify that before that gets thrown off. <laughs> and just to wipe the rest of the room out, if you, those didn't catch you and you're like, I'm okay with no wine, I'm okay with no meat for 10 months, they also couldn't have sex for 10 months. So everybody else is out, except you single people, because you need to be sanctified and keeping it in control. <clears throat> so to, tra to train for this was to be disciplined, <laughs> oh man, was to be determined, right? Endurance doesn't just happen. You don't, you don't just wake up one day looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger. Brandon, I know you wish you could, but you're never going to be as big as Arnold was. And... Not because of Brandon, but just to further on with the bodybuilding analogy. I know y'all are like, oh, well, they, took, they take steroids. Them bodybuilders are on steroids. Go stick a needle in your leg and tell me what happens. Nothing until you actually continue to put in the work. I know there's a big, giant stigma around it, and I'm not using this as a platform to advocate steroids. But you don't end up looking like Arnold Schwarzenegger just out of nowhere. You have to keep working in the gym. You have to keep eating the right way. You do have to have a good diet. You have to have a good workout plan. You have to stay consistent. You can't just go in one time and then call it quits like all the people that sign up on January 1st and new year, new me, new resolution. And all the people that do like going to the gym are like, when is it March and y'all are gone so we can continue working out and not having water bottles on every single piece of equipment. And 
if I didn't make enough people mad about that, you also don't look up, end up looking like the girl from Willy Wonka that ate that little blueberry thing and blew up, and now she's rolling around. You have to have some discipline with your body, with your diet. And I, I'm not bashing anybody. Uh, you know, I absolutely love Oreos. I try to make Kelsey, I get upset when she doesn't buy the family size Oreos. And it actually, I, I am so bad about, I will sit there and I will eat a whole sleeve and I have to stop myself. So I'm preaching to y'all about discipline. If you put a double stuffed Oreo in front of me and a glass of milk, my discipline is out the window, completely out the Kelsey and Riley literally got a pack one time and had to hide it in the cabinet because they didn't want me to eat any of them. I kept wondering how Riley was showing up with Oreos and they wouldn't give me any. It's ridiculous. But we all, need, we, we all need discipline. Now, this next phrase, I want you to write this down if you're taking notes, and it's going to sound way more offensive than it is. So before you bristle up at me, just let me finish the thought through. God <laughs> will bless my obedience, not my obesity. God will bless my obedience, not my obesity. And what I mean by that is we can't just keep coming to church and getting fed and not walking anything out with it. God doesn't want you to be spiritually fat. He wants you to be spiritually fit. If all you're doing is showing up and eating the word and eating the word and you're not doing anything with it and not walking it out, you look like the blueberry girl and you ain't going to be able to run any kind of endurance because running is nowhere in the dictionary of your life and especially not in your faith. Further on in, in Hebrews 12, in, uh, in 7 and 8, he says, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Which ones? All the bad ones. That's not in the Bible. That's, that's the, uh, the JC version. Jared Cochran, not Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 8, if you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Ouch. If you are not disciplined, and we're just going to go with Paul. I know the writer of Hebrews is kind of debated. It's generally accepted as Paul, so I'm going to say Paul. Paul is telling you if you don't have discipline, you're not a true son and daughter at all. Because discipline, discipline is for growth. Discipline is how you grow in your faith. Because physical growth, I can't stop that. I realized the other day we were, we were looking at pictures of the kids, and my oldest, Myla, is going to be 10 this year. That is ridiculous. And Riley's going to be 6. And it's like, I truly didn't understand how fast time was until you have kids. Then it's just like, boop, like Kenny Chesney, as terrible as his music generally is, because it all sounds the same, that whole Don't Blink song really nails it. I'm sorry, I just offended all the cowboy hat wearing people in here. But you can't, you can't stop physical growth, right? Like, it's going to happen. It is a given. Kelsey found two gray hairs on the side of my head the other day. I don't know how. I'm only 33. I'm not shaving, because I got an ugly head. But, uh, you know, I guess I'm going to be a salt and pepper by the end of the year because of how much everybody is stressing me out at home. I'm just kidding. But you, your physical growth, you can't stop it. But spiritual growth is a choice. It is up to you. It is up to you having that daily discipline to grow in your spirit, to accept discipline, to accept correction. This is why the Holy Spirit convicts us. I'm sorry, man. Hey, if you come back next week, Dad will be here. I'm just messing uh, no, your, your spiritual growth is up to you. Right. It, you know, Jesus is moving in you. He's working through you. But it, it is up to you to make those decisions to, to grow your spirit. And it is really easy to, to fall off the tracks, right? Like, I love the Bible app. I love having a paper Bible more. Uh, I fall into the trap of if I miss it on my Bible app, that has like the little streak counter. You guys know what I'm talking about? Like how many days you opened it? I had like a really high number one time and missed one day. I was so upset because it went back down to number one. I'm like, oh man, like I, I still read my Bible, but since I didn't open it up on my phone, I was like, this is ridiculous. I'm, I'm going to hell. 
I missed it. And uh, further along in verse 11, he talks about no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. But later on, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Discipline produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Discipline produces a harvest of peace for those who have been trained by it. For the moment, discipline sucks. Discipline seems painful. Nobody likes to get disciplined. Uh, that's unfortunate because the Bible says spare the rod and spoil the child, and we need to get our belts back out and start whipping some behinds for these kids because of how disgusting the school system is and everything like that. I'm not going to get on that high horse, but uh, it doesn't always have to resort to you beating the snot out of your kid, but sometimes they do need to get the snot beaten out of them. Put that on a reel. But it is, it is later on that you see the purpose behind the discipline. Because we are being trained, we have to be tough. Everything in life is against us. I see you fanning yourself back there. I feel you, sister. It is hot in this room. Can we turn the fan off? But we have to be disciplined in order to see the harvest. It comes later. We have to be tough. We have to endure. We have to persevere. We have to run that race with endurance. And why? Because the race is marked out for us. Marked out. Key word, the race marked out for us. Nobody starts a race and doesn't determine the finish line and where you're starting from. You're not like, hey, we're going to race, go, and take off. And you're just going to keep running until somebody gets tired and whoever has the most cardio is the winner. No, there's always that clear start line. There's that clear finish line. I don't ever remember being in school and somebody said, hey, we're just going to race, but I'm not going to tell you where. Just go. You look at uh, the great theologian Paul Walker and Vin Diesel, you know, from here to the train tracks is a quarter mile. Last one, there's a rotten egg. I don't remember the rest of how the movie went. But our race is the lifelong test of faith that we are called to endure. And here's the thing. We are not in a competition with anyone. It is our race. We are all running our own race. Somebody say, my race is my pace. My race is my pace. We are on our own path. God has a purpose for you. It is marked out for you. He says in Psalms that our steps are established. He orders our steps. They are appointed they are laid out. They are planned for you. God has a purpose for you. He has laid everything out for you. All you have to do is walk it out. But you're running your own path. And when it, 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 he is the strength to get through it. Because there's going to be times when your cardio runs out and you need a little more Christ. And that's when he carries you. When you feel like you can't run any further along and you're just too tired and you're falling to your knees, that's obviously the perfect place to pray but well, you can continue crawling. And when you feel like you can't crawl anymore, he will carry you through life. Amen. Not all the way, because eventually he's going to want to stir you back up and get you back on your feet for you to be strong. He is your source of strength. And what trips you up is when you start thinking that you're supposed to run someone else's race. Because their path is not your purpose, and their promise is not your purpose. You can't compare anyone in, 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 in your race to their race. Comparison is crippling. The, the, the quickest way to fall off track and to fall off of your path in your race is to start comparing yourself to people. This is like, what, my fifth or sixth sermon? I am the worst at comparing myself. I am a perfectionist through and through. I don't go... Yeah, sh- I don't go back. He, he goes back and watches his sermons to determine how to get better. I don't want to watch myself. I know it's good. No, no. I know, it, I know it's good for growth. <laughs> that was the most cocky thing that has ever come out of my I hate ego. Oh, man, that's going to get clipped up on the Internet. Let's do it. My name is Dylan Belcher. I'll see you next week. Uh, 
But no, I, I, am, I am like the king of comparison, comparison comparing myself. Uh, and I, what I meant was, I know, it's good. <laughs> I know it's good for growth, and it would be good to watch myself and figure out what I'm doing wrong and doing, uh, you know, what I feel is wrong. Uh, I know that's good, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to go watch myself. I have to hear my voice throughout the entire week because of all the stuff that Kelsey makes for social media. It's really strange. And y'all are used to hearing yourself talk. Imagine, like, trying to eat breakfast, and you just keep hearing yourself on repeat for, like, six and a half hours <laughs> through someone's phone. It is the weirdest thing. But I, I am so bad with comparing myself because of where I am. And I love the quote that she put on Facebook a couple weeks ago about don't compare your chapter one to someone else's chapter 20. Because it, that, that, is, that is what the problem is with comparison. That is why it trips us up, and that's why it gets us to fall off of our path. Because we're looking at where we are to where someone else is. And JD's like 900 years old, and he's been doing this for his entire life. And if I compare... My level of knowledge now to his level, I'm just going to want to go suck my thumb in my office and have nothing to do with this anymore. But that's because I, I just, I don't know what it is. I'm, I'm up here. I got to tell you all about, hey, don't compare yourself, but I'm going to relate it to you because I do the same thing. That's the, that's the downside of social media right. is you're looking at everybody's highlight reel. You're looking at all their pretty little perfect pictures and every, oh, look at how they looked and dressed up for Easter and y'all didn't see the 900 other pictures of them fighting each other, and they had to edit in some teeth because they knocked each other's mouth out. <laughs> like, I can't imagine how, like, the fitness influencers look. If you go through their camera reel, there's got to be, like, what, 900 million selfies before they find the one that has the right angle and then this, and then they got to apply, like, 57 filters to it to try to look pretty and look good. But we don't see that, right? We see, oh, look, they look amazing. And we're over there eating a McDonald's cheeseburger, wondering why we can't be the same. <laughs> or like that, me eating a sleeve of Oreos. Man, where's my abs? That's why I got my stomach tattooed, so I don't have to do crunches anymore. <laughs> but you, you can't focus on a bad beginning to your story to someone who's at the height of their stride. And that's the problem, because we're looking at where we are compared to where they are. They have been putting in work. They might be further along in their walk with God. They could have been walking this out like JD. He's older, obviously, but I'm not comparing myself to the fact that he's older. I'm comparing myself to the fact of, wow, he sounds great. Why can't I sound like that? And I got to <laughs> And I got to come up here after him doing this for 40 years and try to fill your shoes even though my feet are smaller, so that's never going to happen because God gave me arches. Never mind. Let's get back to the text. <laughs> but that, that's the thing. Just like I got so far off track, you are going to lose yourself when you try to follow in someone else's footsteps. If you are trying to follow someone else's faith and you're not putting it in Jesus, you are going to fall right off of that path as fast as possible. That is the easiest way to trip you up, and you are never going to be able to walk it out through and turn through to eternity. And that is why we have to fix our focus. Because where, where are you looking? When you're on your walk with God, if you're stuck comparing, comparing yourself to everyone else, and you're stuck looking at where everyone else is, or if you're looking down at your feet because you're so stuck in this depression of your life and you can't look forward and you're just looking around at everyone else, how are you going to make it through? How are you going to move any further in your faith? And that's why you have to fix your focus. The verse says, fixing our eyes on Jesus. You've got to keep your eyes on the prize. Looking around gets you nowhere. You have to stay focused on Jesus. That's the only way you're going to make it through this life. He is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. And no one, no one else is ever going to love you the way that he does. Nobody else. Can you put verse 2 up for me, Hebrews 12, verse 2? Oh, y'all on it today. I love it. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Y'all don't. Nothing? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. The cross was joy. The cross was joy. I don't know about y'all, but with the people 
that attack us on YouTube, I'm not going to go lay down my life for them. No, I'm not. <laughs> no. Jesus already did. But obviously, I'm not going to lay my life down for someone that's persecuting me. But he has joy at the cross. Joy at the cross. Can any of us say that we would gladly lay our lives down for someone that hates us? Y'all get anxiety about ordering DoorDash, and there ain't any way that you're going to lay your life down for someone who's never going to accept you and reject you. But Jesus had joy at the cross. And I don't know about you, but like excruciating pain to me doesn't sound like joy. But here's the thing. Jesus loves us so much that he viewed the cross as joy because he was anticipating a personal relationship with each and every one of us who put our faith in him. That is how Jesus looked at the cross with joy. He wanted and he was waiting on that relationship with you. It is the joy at the cross that is pointing to his love for us, his desire for the relationship with us, that daily relationship with us, not just coming in here today and never talking to him again for the rest of the week until you show up next week. If all you did was eat breakfast this morning, don't eat again until next week and let me see how your body looks, how you feel. It's going to feel like dirt. You're going to feel like death. But yet that is what the majority of people do every single week. And not, I'm not saying y'all, but just as a general term, we come to church and then we forget all about Jesus until the rest of the week. If you haven't found us on version, and this is probably going to make you not do it, but we get analytics and we can see with the amount of people that have set our church, <laughs> we can see the percentage of people that open the Bible daily and weekly. And let me tell you, it ain't high. That's why Jesus wants your discipline. He wants your daily relationship because he deserves, he laid down his life for you. He deserves your devotion because he, he is the whole reason that we go through this life looking forward to the finish, that we're called to endure. And he's the only one that bridged the gap for us. He's the only reason why you have life. He's the only one that gives you true joy. He's the only one that gives you peace and hope and strength. And he's the only reason that you have a purpose. I don't care how much you love your career. Jesus is your ultimate purpose. He endured the cross so that we can join him in eternity. Put verse 3 up. Because that's not all he endured. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. <clears throat> such opposition from sinners. He endured the persecution first before the pain that had a purpose. And we are called to consider him. Consider him who endured such opposition. Consider the hatred that he faced. Consider the fact that he wasn't even accepted in his hometown. That means his relatives, his friends that he grew up with, everybody that was his buddy, guess what? They all started hating him when he came out and was saying that he was the Messiah. <clears throat> Consider the fact that he still, with the joy before him, went towards, towards the cross. Consider the fact that he was mocked. Consider the fact that he was often misunderstood, misquoted. His name was blasphemed. Consider the fact of the shame that he had to have felt being naked on the cross, being stripped down and being beaten. Consider the fact of how badly he was beaten. If you've seen The Passion of the Christ, you would have an idea. Consider that, that he was stripped, that he was flogged. And consider how he was spit on and he was nailed to a cross for your sins. He endured the weight of sin so that we are all stripped of it, and we don't have to. Amen. He did it all for us, so we don't have to. So that we don't grow weary and lose heart. That you grow weary. You don't just end up being weary. Right, come on. Just as much as your endurance takes time and a process to get there, so does weariness. You don't just end up being exhausted. You grow 
weary. And let me tell you, you get there a whole lot faster when you lose your focus. And that's why we have to stay focused on God, on, on, God, on Jesus. We have to stay focused. And I know it's real easy, easy when times get tough that you just want to give up. And is it all worth it? Of course it's worth it. Have you considered the alternative? You can't just give up on God when the going gets gritty. Just because something starts, it doesn't look good. We have to endure. In Galatians 6, 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The, the harvest comes at the proper time. Not on the timeline we made up in our head, because God, I'm starting this new business, and if I don't have a million dollars in my bank by the end of the year, uh, you must not really be there. Or, God, my, my, my kid has been running from you for years, and I've been praying and praying and praying, but nothing has changed yet. But I'm planting those seeds because it's at the proper time that we reap the harvest if we don't give up. Because I know a lot of times we like to cut the Bible verse in half on the part that sounds good. I'm going to reap a harvest. But it says if you don't give up. Because you can't give up. You have to endure for eternity. When you're tired, press on. Do what you need to. Drink, drink a, a, a Jesus cup of coffee and keep pushing on. Do some jumping jacks and push on. When the depression is so overwhelming and you feel like you can't walk anymore, and I know it sounds so much easier to just say, yeah, just keep on, just keep pushing on. And that's so much easier to say when you don't have a child that you've lost or a parent or a grandparent that has committed suicide or someone that you know or yourself that is dealing with just, just this massive addiction that has been over your life for years and the hospital bills are piling up. It's so much easier to just say, yeah, just keep pushing on. But that is the thing. The life that we live is temporary. All of this, we're a vapor. All of this is temporary. This is not our home. Ever since we fell out of the garden, we've been wandering in the wilderness. And this is not our home. We look forward to the mansion that our maker is setting aside for us in heaven, which is more bougie than Las Vegas could ever hope to be. But you can't lose heart. You can't give up on God. He has, he has never given up on you. And he never will. His love never fails. It never runs out. It never gives up on you. It will never run out on you. It gets hard to endure. There's a, there's a new song that Elevation has coming out. And the only way you can get it, if you're impatient like I am, is to order uh, Pastor Stephen Furtick's new book, Do the New You. Um, but the song is called God is Not Against Me. And the chorus says, uh, he's in it with me. He's fighting for me. Working the, working th he's in it with me, fighting for me, working through me. God is not against me. Well, how does your viewpoint of God look? Because he is our heavenly father, but if your whole depiction of a father is how bad your father beat you on this earth, you're going to view God as an angry God. <laughs> and that's not the case. He is always working through you. I know discipline doesn't feel good. But the whole point of discipline is to get you to grow, to get you to mature. That's why we have so many weak little beta males running around the United States right now because nobody wanted to pop a cap in their butt and get them to wake up and get a job and go do something with their life. Amen. So I'm going to give you all a secret. Can you put verse 2 up one more time? Oh, I know something y'all don't know, and I love it. <clears throat> fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning his shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The pioneer. Oh, man, if y'all knew, you'd be shouting. Tell me to hurry up. I'm walking it out, Mom. You got to have endurance to get through this message. <laughs> got to have some patience. You 
tell dad to slow down, and now I slow down. Hurry <laughs> up. Don't worry, son, he's just waiting. Pioneer and perfecter of faith. A pioneer, oh, I love this. A pioneer is a person who is among the first to enter or settle a region, thus opening it for occupation and development for others. The first to enter or settle a region, thus opening it for occupation by others. Pioneer. The ESV says founder, like foundation. He establishes it. Jesus Christ is the establisher of our faith. He is the founder of faith. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the beginning and the end. And we're talking about running a race. And here's the secret. Jesus Christ is the beginning and the finish line of your race. He is the start and the end. And that is how we do not grow weary in this life. Our life begins and ends in Jesus. He has established our faith. Our faith is rooted in him. And if your roots don't go deep enough, you're not going to be able to stand firm enough. But that is why he is the beginning of our faith, because he established it. He is where the race begins. He is where your walk begins. He is where your eternity begins. Your eternal life does not begin when you die. It began when you laid your life down at Jesus' feet and accepted him as your Lord and Savior. That is where your eternal life begins. So you have this hope that when you die, you're going to still exist. Whether you know Jesus or you don't. We don't want to talk about that part. Oh, yeah, heaven. Not everybody's getting in heaven. We just heard the message last week. A whole lot more people are going to be in hell than heaven. And here's the thing, church. It is up to us to help a whole lot more people get there. He is not just the pioneer. Put it up one more time. Put it up. Mm. He is the perfecter of faith. Only Jesus lived the perfect life, which means Jesus is the only ultimate example of trust in God. He is the only example of reliance on God, and he is the only example of a true commitment to God. He paved the way for you. He shows you how to pray. He shows you how to overcome temptation. He shows you how to overcome addiction. He shows you how to overcome your suffering. He shows you how to overcome your pain and your depression and your weakness. He shows you how to overcome everything because he is the example of enduring loyalty to God because he is the ultimate and the only example of the one who already ran the race and secured the victory for us. That is why he is our strength. That is why he is our hope. That is why he is our peace and our love and our joy and our happiness. That is why he is your helper. That is why he is your defender. He already ran the race so that you can have eternal life. He laid the foundation for you to stand firm on. James 1.12. Y'all can come up. I'm getting close. James 1.12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. The prize is promised. I thought y'all would have been so much more excited about that than that response. The prize, don't even give me a, a sympathy clap at this, but the prize is promised. There is a crown awaiting you in heaven when you get there. And guess what? You don't even have to wait for it because Jesus already gives you the authority on earth to do the works that he did and more. And the Bible says that if all of the works that he did were contained, the the books couldn't contain it. We're missing so much information on what he actually did. And he gives you authority and dominion over this earth to do the same thing that he did. And what do we do with it? Nothing. I'm just kidding. The only problem here, the only problem here is since the prize is promised, (laughs) so are the problems. And y'all thought it would be easy. 
Nobody said this life would be easy, but it's going to be a lot easier with Jesus. Because if it was easy, it wouldn't have taken the cross. If it was easy, everybody would be in church right here and we would not have seats. If it was easy, it wouldn't give you anxiety to share your faith to your coworkers. If it was, if it was easy, nobody would be rejecting him. There wouldn't be any parades. There wouldn't be any strip clubs. There wouldn't be that many bars. If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. We wouldn't have a multitude of people turning away. Don't, I'm, I'm gonna read one more, but don't put it up yet until I get there, please. In John 16, don't put it up yet. To give y'all some background information, this is the disciples talking. I'm starting in verse 30. When I get to 33, it'll be on the screens. They said, and they're talking to Jesus, now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. God knows your thoughts. He knows every single hair on your head with a number. The stars are named. This makes us believe that you came from God. Verse 31, do you now believe, Jesus replied, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. If y'all don't watch the family room, you have no idea where I'm going with this. And shame on you. I'm just kidding. The, it, it, on, on our YouTube and our Facebook, we do a live stream every Wednesday night at 6 where my dad and I break down the Sunday messages uh, and we read the comments. It's like a live interaction and dialogue um, to where we just break down the message a little bit more. It is, it is one of my favorite days of the week to just get a little bit deeper. And if you can't make it, it, you don't have to come to the building. All you have to do is log on. But I brought this up on Wednesday in a little bit different fashion. Verse 32, a time is coming and in fact has come when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. Verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Leave it up, leave it up for one second. Jesus knew the disciples were going to scatter after his arrest. They were still weak. They, they weren't the great people who wrote all the books after this. He knew that they were weak, and he still accepted their statement of faith, which was, we know you know all things. And my iPad just reset. We know you know all things, and we believe that you came from God. Jesus knows all your pain. He knows all your struggles. He knows all your thoughts. He knows every deep little nasty thing that you're trying to hide behind your back. He knows how you're clearing your browser history when your wife's not home. He knows the bottles that you're hiding under your cabinet. He knows the pills that you haven't flushed down the toilet yet. And he has still accepted your statement of faith when you put your life in him. He still chose you. You didn't choose him, he chose you. You didn't find him, he found you. He tells us, in this life we will face trouble. You put it up one more time, I know I'm asking a whole lot today. It's okay, take your time. <laughs> the prize was promised. In this world, you will have trouble. The trouble is promised. But he says, in your job, you may have peace. In your grandma, you may have peace. In your boyfriend, you may have peace. He doesn't say that. He says, in me, you may have peace. And in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. State Farm has it covered. You're in good hands with all state. No, see, he warned the disciples of what they would face 
which means he's telling us the same thing. You're going to have trouble. You're going to have problems. But he also told them that they wouldn't do it alone. And neither will you. He said his father is with him. And he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us. He is with you in the good times. He's with you in the bad times. He's with you when you're drunk, when you're high, when you smell nasty and haven't taken a shower in a week. He is always with you and he is fighting for you. All he wants you to do is focus on him, put your faith in him, and follow him. He accepted their faith because he knew what they would face. He knew their weaknesses, but he also knew <laughs> He knew Peter was going to have a bad attitude. He knew what Judas was going to do. It's, it's too easy to read the Bible and just think like, oh, okay, all this stuff just happened. Y'all don't realize like Jesus before he came down to heaven existed outside of time. If you really want to have your mind blown, God is watching this sermon. He's watching the creation of the earth. He's watching the fall of Satan. He's watching when you gave your life to him all at the same time. <laughs> he knew Judas. He knew Peter before they did what they did, before they grew into who they needed to grow into to further his kingdom. But he says, take heart. You have overcome the world. No, he said, I have overcome the world. He overcame it all. Not you, not me. He already ran the race, so you don't have to worry. If your cardio ain't that good, guess what? He already got the victory. He already finished the fight, so you don't have to fear. He already won, so all you have to do is follow him and rely on him. And the bottom line that I want you to walk away with today is Jesus won the race so that you can walk with him. <sighs> he did everything. All you have to do is chase him. And it gets hard. Nobody said it's going to be easy. He died and he rose again. And all the disciples died nasty deaths. And as horrible as that is, and nobody wants to go through that, they are all throwing the party in heaven. And we're all invited. All you got to do is wait to get there. All you got to do is walk with Jesus to get there. All you got to do is place your faith in Jesus and follow him with the rest of your life. He gave everything of himself. And if we give anything less, is it not just a disappointing disservice to our creator who literally breathes life into you every day? you're getting a renewal of strength. <clears throat> Every day, you're getting a renewal of peace. Every day, you're getting a renewal of breath. What are you doing with the 24 hours every single day that he is charging you with? Are you just going through the motions? Are you just going to work, coming home, and coming to church on Sunday? Because that's great. I'm glad you're here. But... <laughs> To offend y'all once again, I don't want fat people in church. I want fit people in church. And I'm not talking about the size of your pants. I'm talking about the size of your purpose. Y'all, I want this church to dominate this city. I have been praying for revival to come, and I don't care if it's greedy or what, but I'm praying that it starts here, that it starts here. And the way that that starts and furthers is when y'all go and talk to people about it and share your faith. And if you're scared, he is with you. 
if you're afraid you don't know enough, he is with you. We are all just vessels. He sent the Holy Spirit to be with us, to help us and to guide us. All you got to do. I purposely typed less notes today so that I could step out in faith. And I don't know about y'all, but I feel a whole lot better than this than any of the other ones I've done. And it ain't about me, but I feel good. I am fired up. And that's all God needs is you to take that first little step and then take another one and take another one. And if there is anybody in here, if you could all stand on your feet and bow your heads, please. If there is anybody in here that has yet to give their life to Jesus, or if you're watching online, whether it's now live or after the fact, <clears throat> I want us all to pray this together as a church. And I know a lot of people, I'm not going to do a cop out like last week's with the thief on the cross, even though it was absolutely brilliant. I'm going to still call you out for it because I'm salty. It was so good. If you repeat after me, Heavenly Father, I admit and I lay my sins at your feet. My purpose is found only in you. And I thank you for sending your son who died for me and rose again. Thank you, Jesus, for giving me life. I will follow you for the rest of my days. Amen. Is there anybody in here that has prayed that for the first time? Because we are celebrating with you. I am believing that somebody online, somewhere, this is the first time that you have said that. And I want to see hands up every single time, every single week. Because there is a party in heaven when you pray those things or when you say that prayer. I know a lot of people don't think it is biblical. How else are you going to place your faith in Jesus? You have to make that statement of faith and step out. going to have that endurance church we're going to have that faith we're going to have that spiritually fit body y'all can go eat barbecue don't feel guilty about it but when you go home this message comes right back on at three o'clock and you can share it on your facebook you can share it on your twitter or your whatever there is now i don't know i don't have that many spread the gospel Jesus charged you with it in Mark 16, 15. Go preach the word to the entire world. It is not just my job. It's not just JD's or Dylan's or my dad's job. You don't have to have a platform to have a purpose. Let your social media be your platform. Let your work be your platform. Instead of talking about conspiracies at family dinner, talk about Jesus. Thank you guys so much for coming. Hey, I hope you enjoyed today's message. If you did, make sure that you share and subscribe so that we can get you these sermons as soon as they are available. I'd like to take a moment and thank everyone that's a part of the family. Whether you serve with us or give financially, it's because of you that we are able to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus. If you have any questions or would like to get more involved, click the link in the description. Thank you. Have a blessed week.